My name is Ronin Alin. I have a doctorate in geology and I believe I exist because Jesus Christ designed and created the universe, the earth and living organisms. When I look at the trajectory of history described in the Bible, it consistently depicts a beginning where a powerful God establishes a carefully planned and regulated system and then followed by a conflict and degeneration where this system loses its balance, followed by an intervention that brings promise of restoration and gives individuals a choice and a role to play. I find evidence of all these elements power, order, design, disruption, strife, promise, and the choice in the world that surrounds me and in my personal experience. So the biblical account of origins is like a set of moves that helps me solve the Rubik's cube and makes perfect sense of an array of different pieces of reality. I have learned that God is big. The scale and the power of geological processes is unfathomable from the human perspective. And yet the Earth is just a minuscule object in the cosmos. I know that astronomers would have even more impressive examples of massive processes, but those affecting the crust of the Earth, those we can touch and we can sample firsthand and the texture of the world is so rich, from the subatomic structure, to isotope, to minerals, to outcrops, to formations, to basins, to plates, to exoplanets. Each level has so much detail, so much complexity, that there is always more to learn. Only a big God can provide such a limitless canvas. The features you are talking about, like uh, mountain ranges or oceanic depressions, in fact, even continents and ocean floors themselves, these are all large-scale features, and they are best understood in terms of how the crust and the mantle of the Earth formed and behave under stress. So when I look at the Earth as a whole, I see the fingerprints of design in it being a rocky planet with liquid water on its surface and an atmosphere. All these elements make life possible on the planet. I believe that this organization occurred during a recent creation week. However, I don't know if the materials of which the Earth is made or even the planet uh, in an inhabited state pre-existed this creation week. Now, if you are looking at the configuration of the continents and the way plates have moved around in the past, this is known as uh, plate tectonics. Today, the deformation of the crust uh, in processes like collision or subduction is thought to, to occur at a very low rate, um, millimeters per year. So to accommodate large plate motions over a short time, would require catastrophic rates of plate tectonics, perhaps during the flood. Some creationists have explored this possibility with numerical models, but it is certainly an area where much has to be done and uh, at the very fringe, I would say, of conventional science. So I keep an eye open and uh, a vested interest in this area of research, although I am not a specialist in structural geology. On the other hand, when it comes to many landforms in which the modern landscape is sculpted, like canyons, terraces, and valleys, it is less iconoclastic and more accepted that there are rapid and even catastrophic processes that could form these features at rates often much faster than plate motions. Oh, 
Oh, there are many. The most popular are undoubtedly meteoritic impacts. Some of the largest impacts have left detectable impact structures and deposits uh, generated by the collision of an asteroid with the Earth's crust. However, from the perspective of the sedimentary record, I don't think that impact-related processes would be the most significant uh, evidence of uh, catastrophic processes. My choice uh, would go to mass transport deposits and sediment gravity flows. What are these? These are processes of mobilization and transport of often large volumes of sediments, commonly driven by gravity, that can have instantaneous triggers like earthquakes and travel for long distances over time scales of minutes to hours or days. They can occur in uh, subaerial and subaqueous environments alike. Obviously, they are more likely to occur in the presence of a topographic gradient, like the transition from the continental shelf to the slope or in alluvial fans at the fo foothills of uh, some uh, raised land masses. So individual events vary in scale and in volume of sediment involved. Therefore, in the rock record, we can find them expressed uh, as uh, thin beds all the way up to massive beds, tens of meters thick, and laterally continuous for tens of kilometers, like the famous mega turbidites of the Hecho group in, in Spain. Some sedimentary successions are predominantly made of these kind of deposits, and they are beginning to be recognized as important, even in fine-grained deposits, and they are known as low-density turbidites. There are other kinds of catastrophic deposits that are common in the rock record, like uh, storm-related beds. Therefore, a significant portion of the sedimentary record is the result of event and episodic deposition, rather than slow, gradual accumulation of background settling from, of, uh, of sediment. Let me begin by saying that from the perspective of the fossil record, this evolutionary model of two progressively divergent lineages starting from a common ancestor and ending up with humans on one side and chimps, our sister group, on the other side, is an abstract concept, not supported by real data points from the fossil record. Just look at the fossil record of chimpanzees. That should document uh, one of these two lineages, but in fact, it's really, really small. All it consists of is a few teeth. So this would be sufficient to point out how fragmentary the record of this alleged evolutionary series is. So close to the alleged split between the two lineages, there are only two taxa uh, based on extremely fragmentary remains with much uncertainty about their alleged relation to the human lineage. And then stratigraphically higher up, we have uh, clusters of taxa with findings mostly in the hominin lineage, the branch that is alleged to have split and led to humans. So here we have distinct forms mostly showing signs of uh, bipedalism, including australopithecines and many species in the genus Homo. However, the relationship between all these different forms is far from being understood and highly contested. Moreover, there are real morphological discontinuities or mosaic distribution of characters between taxa. And there are also stratigraphic intervals with very little yield of hominin fossils like, for example, the lowermost Pleistocene. All this contributes to make the evolutionary account of human evolution much unresolved and, most importantly, poorly documented when it comes to the fossil record, especially in its supposed early stages. When classifying things, people tend to divide in two different camps based on their propensity to highlight similarities between items or differences. And so the same is true in paleontology, where there is a certain degree of arbitrariness in deciding how much variation 
warrants the establishment of a separate taxon. So we have splitters, who are those who would be dwelling more on the unusual features to establish a new species. And then we have lumpers, and th those would be the ones that would accept a large degree of intraspecific variability to account for a range of skeletal anatomy. So when it comes to the hominin fossil record, there has been a fair amount uh, of tension between splitters and lumpers uh, playing out. However, in the past two decades or so, there have indeed been some fossils that have been described where the majority of the experts uh, agreed that they represented a morphotype that is distinct enough to warrant the establishment of a new species. So these include the species you mentioned, like uh, Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi, but also Australopithecines like uh, Australopithecus sediba. Therefore, the picture we get when we look at the fossil record of Homo or, or Australopithecines is one of a significant degree of variability with coeval populations showing distinctive traits. There are also some examples of high morphological variability within the same population. Most creationists would interpret this diversity as something that was expressed in a post-flood context, as population dispersed over the Earth. Possible mechanisms responsible for this range of phenotypes include uh, responses to environmental conditions, effects related to small population size, and hybridization between different types. Limestones, or carbonate rocks to be more generic, are a fascinating kind of rock because they lie at the interface of chemical, physical, and biological processes. So very often one could correctly say that carbonates grow rather than they are deposited because the precipitation of carbonate can be mediated by organisms. So many organisms have calcified skeletons ranging from minuscule nanoplankton to more familiar mollusks like oysters and clams. At times, the production levels of this biological factory are so significant that the entire structure made of carbonate can be built, like coral reefs. It is also true, however, that upon death and fragmentation, carbonate skeletal particles behave like uh, other grains and clasts and can be shifted around and stacked by currents and other physical processes. And finally, carbonates can also precipitate directly from the water column without the direct mediation of organisms. And in this sense, they also represent a kind of chemical rock. So when large accumulations of carbonates that are interpreted to have a biological origin are found in the rock record, this creates a time problem for a short chronology, especially if these structures formed in place and are not the result of transport, because it would take time for them to grow. So this challenge is not always of easy solution, but uh, it is something that encourages me to study rather than driving me away from research. Instead of taking for granted the gradualistic assumption of a long chronology of millions of years or slow formation for some of these structures, I am always on the lookout for features that would point to more rapid processes for the genesis of limestones, including chemical precipitation of cements and micrite, which is a fine-grained sediment made of very small calcite crystals. Time and again, it has been shown that it is fruitful to approach a problem from different perspectives. Therefore, although I don't have all the answers, I believe I can contribute with original suggestions and play a constructive role within the larger fabric of the geological scientific community. <laughs>